These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Hammurabi was born a king, and he was exactly the sort of king you imagine a true king to be. Dignified, proud, and stern, possessing deep wisdom, low cunning, and high intelligence in equal degrees. He was benevolent and patronizing to those loyal to him, clinically ruthless to his enemies, and a crafty manipulator of everyone else. In public, his regal poise was unshakable, but when irritated and when it was appropriate or beneficial to show it, he had a cold, sharp fury that drew upon his powerful intellect to humiliate those who displeased him. Plenty of kings throughout history have attempted to portray themselves within this patriarch archetype, but for Hammurabi, we are in the unique position of having enough personal letters and anecdotes from the years of his life that we can say that, for him, it wasn't just an act. He truly was the quintessential king, the very best of the monarchical system of government. This is not an underdog story like Sargon or Shamsi Adad. Hammurabi is a man who was born with quite a lot and used his tremendous gifts and inheritance to become the man with everything, building a powerful Mesopotamian state into the greatest Mesopotamian empire since the fall of Akkad. By all rights, Hammurabi's story starts with his father, Sin Mubalit, who took the throne in 1812. We watched in our southern series of episodes as Babylon slowly coalesced from a home base for a tribal confederation into a proper capital city, a process which took about 80 years. With Sin Mubalit, the process is more or less complete, and he is the first man to claim the actual title of king over the city of Babylon. Sin Mubalit's territory at Ascension is poorly defined, but it definitely extends out past the city itself, with both Amorite tribes that owe him fealty and other Mesopotamian cities. He expands this territory during his 19 years, and at some point he controls the region of Mesopotamia where the two rivers come closest together. Kish, Sippar, Borsippa, and Kazalu are the major cities if you're trying to spot it on a map, but there were an assortment of other smaller towns that get mentions as well. Of course, if we are counting the assets of Sin Mubalit, then we must surely also count the alliance that he inherited with Uruk, based on marriages and family ties going back a few generations now. They are so close that we have a letter from the king of Uruk to Sin Mubalit, which begins, God knows that since we have come to know each other, I have trusted you as one would trust in Ishtar, and my head has rested on your very own lap. For these reasons, for us to be in harmony, my opinion and yours should be the same. And shortly after this letter was sent, Uruk convinced Babylon to join in the Antia Larsid coalition of Rimsin's 14th year. As we already saw in Rimsin's episode, this coalition army would be destroyed utterly, and Uruk would be taken by the southern power three years later, and this would leave a lasting sense of hostility between the two powers. Of course, real politic dominated the age, and if the other states of Sumer and Akkad couldn't unite to stop the ascendant power, then it was time for Babylon to move on to Plan B, which was to become strong enough to resist the rising power on its own. As such, in the final days of Uruk, with the fate of the city pretty well sealed, Babylon turned on the weaker two former allies, Isin and Rapicum, plundering each for its own gain. However, Babylon was the least of its neighbors at this point. In the south, holding Isin may have been seen as strategic overreach, leaving the kingdom vulnerable to Larsen counterattack, and so Isin was brutally pillaged, but then abandoned. In the north, Shamsi Adad had recently taken Assyria, and was also making a minor move towards Rapicum, and while the details are lost, we know that possession of the town remained a low-level diplomatic sticking point in the years to come. We're going to hear more about the diplomatic dance to manipulate the balance of power under the much more well-documented Hammurabi, but it's clear that Sin Mubalit spends much of his life in diplomatic correspondence with Shamsi Adad, Larsa, Eshnuna, and Mari, as well as constant raiding and small-scale warfare as each kingdom tests its neighbors. 
but Sin Mubalit's main concern throughout his life is the rising power of Larsa. There were the battles already mentioned, but also, as he initiated the building projects expected of a king of his stature, his canal digging began to disrupt the massive and possibly poorly planned out canal system of Larsa. This was an existential threat to the southern kingdom, though whether Babylon dug its canals with aggressive intent or just for its own use is unclear. Small armies of a few hundred men would travel up and down the border, raiding and defending canals opportunistically, and twice in his career, Sin Mubalat wins larger pitched battles over this, probably in places where a few thousand troops had come together. But he's never able to make a breakthrough as Rim Sin continues his ascent. Sin Mubalit builds and builds. Walls, temples, canals, all the things expected of a good ruler. And in his 16th year, he finally spots an opportunity to upset the balance of power in his favor. Isim, a decrepit shadow of its former glory, is weak, while Babylon is enjoying the dividends of a prosperous decade or so. And Sin Mubalit strikes, possibly leading the army personally. The battle is a great success, bringing back plenty of plunder for Babylon, but strategically, the entire thing goes sour when Rim Sin is able to jump on the city in the following year and capture his long-hated nemesis. Isin itself might have only been a small matter for Babylon, but for Larsa, the final victory in a 200-year rivalry energized the nation and put Larsa in the strongest position it had ever seen. In the north, too, Shamsi Adad now ruled over the largest territorial empire Mesopotamia had seen since the fall of Ur, and was possibly the wealthiest of the players with control of the Assyrian merchants. Eshnuna occupied the northeast, sitting squarely on a key trade route into the mountains of Iran, and more than willing to join in with whichever power offered them a greater chance of plunder and territorial expansion. While in the east, there were signs of a freshly resurgent Elamite empire ready again to turn its gaze westward. Yamhad was typically accounted as the strongest local power, with the most kings subject to it. But here was a spot of luck, since Babylon did not yet share a border with them, and as such they could work together well enough if given a reason. And so, while Babylon shouldn't be thought of as a weak power surrounded by huge bullies, it is still only a kingdom with a handful of major cities situated at a strategically important crossroads and measuring only 100 miles by 60 miles in extent. Sin Mubalat had spent nearly 20 years solidifying his control over the region and keeping Babylon strong enough to keep playing, but the city's ultimate victory was still far from certain. The details of Sin Mubalat's defeat are unclear, and the few historians who mention it don't all seem to agree on what the story is. But it seems that in a campaign either following Lars's capture of Isin or somehow related to it, Babylon's army took a defeat, and one of the conditions assigned by Rim Sin was that Sin Mubalat abdicate the throne in favor of his young son, assuming that the new king would be less of a threat than his father had been. It could also be that upon seeing Isin's defeat, the aged Sin Mubalat realized that he was too old to effectively lead Babylon in the coming conflict and saw the promise in his son. Or maybe he was just sick and old and abdicated with no thought to external circumstances. Whatever the case, in the year 1792, possibly right at the new year, a young but stern Hammurabi took the throne of Babylon, ready to win the Mesopotamian Game of Thrones that had been raging for the last 200 years. His name means something like Great Family in Akkadian, a name to bring honor to his lineage, and the best estimate of his birthday, two years into his father's reign, puts him at 18 or 20 years old. The first thing he does, in his own words, is to establish justice in the land. Now this is not, as you might think, a reference to his famous law code, which would not be issued until the last third of his reign, but to a more general set of what could be thought of as social justice proclamations. 
Now, I and many of you are anxious to get to his law code, but rather than dedicate a single episode to the law code, we're going to look at provisions of it constantly throughout this series of episodes about his life and times, since we can extract information about military organization, economic conditions, the integration of Amorite and Akkadian cultures, the, and ideas of religion and justice from this massive legal text. It seems likely that even before the famous stone obelisk that sits in the Louvre today was carved, many of these laws and precedents already existed in some similar form and reflect the general social conditions of the kingdom throughout this period. And so I'm confident enough that it's worthwhile to start discussing and citing parts of the code when they come up in other aspects of his rule. Hammurabi's code is not, as is often claimed, the oldest law code in the world. We've covered some of its predecessors already in previous episodes, but it is the longest and best preserved from the Bronze Age, and in its own time it was considered a masterpiece of law, studied as a model of jurisprudence even a thousand years later. But if establishing justice doesn't refer to the law code, what is it? Most importantly, Hammurabi is following a Mesopotamian tradition of canceling debts, which were endemic through the region and a constant source of social distress. Legally, a loan in silver could have no more than 20% annual interest, and a loan in grain could have no more than 33 and a third percent interest. And this was considered to be substantially better than the far harsher loans that existed in places with more poorly enforced laws. Of course, these are still pretty heavy rates, and it was easy to fall into a debt spiral, pledging more and more of your meager possessions to creditors in order to secure the loans needed to pay off the previous loan. In the ultimate extremity, it was far from uncommon for a person to pledge his house, his land, all his possessions, his children, his wife, and himself as collateral for a loan. And with this, there was nothing else for a man to pledge, and the creditors would come in and take all his property and bring his whole family into slavery. These annulments of debt occurred pretty much whenever the ruling king felt like, or whenever a new ruler thought he needed more public support, and were more common in some cities than others. In Babylon, it seems to be the case that when Hammurabi announced this forgiveness, the majority of the debt was originally owed to the palace as tax revenue, and commercial loans were specifically exempted. So this would have been a financial hit primarily to the palace, not to the general class of loan sharks. Hammurabi would issue two more of these, the last shortly after his conquest in the south in order to shore up support in newly conquered Sumer. Given the extent to which we know Hammurabi was personally involved in judicial proceedings, we have letters in which he renders verdicts on economic cases as small as ten shekels, it seems likely that his establishment of justice included more than the forgiveness of debts. All Mesopotamian kings in these days had centuries of precedent to make them the ultimate judicial authority within their realm, but we have indications that some kings took to this more enthusiastically than others, and Hammurabi seems to have micromanaged at least some of his judicial representatives to a very large degree. This suggests that his establishment of justice may also have included a certain amount of small-scale legal reform in anticipation of his later law code. Those are the specifics can only be guessed at. But establishing justice, while important and probably quite popular, was not the highest duty of a Mesopotamian king. Nor, for that matter, was waging endless warfare, though certainly quite a lot of that seems to have gone on as well. The Mesopotamians believed very strongly that humanity, and by extension the king at the very top of humanity, existed to serve the gods. And not just in some vague, abstract way either, they believed that humanity had been created to serve snacks to the gods. There have been multiple different creation myths told by the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Amorites over the centuries by now, but one thing that remained unchanged between all of them is the general story of how humanity was created. You see, in the beginning, there was just the gods. The high gods and the low gods. 
and when the gods wanted something done, they had to go out and do it themselves, which left very little time for partying and relaxing. There are a few different versions with different specifics, one even has a rebellion in the heavens, but in the end, the gods agree that the best thing to do would be to make a race of slave robots out of clay. These robots would be forced in terrible conditions to build the fancy temple palaces for the gods to live in, to brew all the beer for the gods' refreshment, and to grow crops for heavenly snack time. This way the gods could spend all day in leisure, a plan which the gods universally thought was excellent, and the suffering of these clay robots was considered hilarious. These clay robots, who existed only to serve the best bling and the best party supplies, were, of course, humanity, and the king at the top of the social hierarchy was given his position of privilege by the gods only so that he could organize the laborers and keep the temples shiny and well stocked. Every king tended to this duty, no matter how otherwise inept they were. The religious cynicism of today had, as far as we can tell, no place in the Bronze Age, and no genuine atheist sentiment exists anywhere in the historical record until at least ancient Greece. For Hammurabi, bringing order and justice to his terrestrial realm was inexorably linked with providing sustenance and glory for the gods and so his first few years were occupied exclusively with building projects, building and renovating temples, improving and repairing the walls of his subject cities, and digging canals through the plains of Babylonia to increase the amount of agricultural land and to allow boats to travel further inland. The capital itself would have undergone extensive improvements during this period of prosperity, but it's sadly impossible to tell you how Babylon looked at this early date, or even how it compared with the other cities of the age, because at some point in the city's history, the Euphrates River shifted and buried the older portions of the city. All the existing archaeological digs have been on the newer sections of the city. With all this constructing and praying and justice establishing, Hammurabi didn't have very much time in his early years for military adventuring. But he was a new king, with the patience and wisdom to take things slowly. After all, this decade are the years when both Rim Sin in the south and Shamsi Adad in the north reached the height of their power, and in many ways, the best position that Babylon could wrangle itself into was that of a junior partner to one or both. He may have begun his reign with conciliatory diplomacy towards Rim Sin, but there was a limit to good relations with the power that had so recently taken Babylon's old ally Uruk. The diplomacy between the great powers never ended in this period, and Rim Sin would at times be convinced to work side by side with the Babylonians. But for Hammurabi's first decade, whenever he looked outside his kingdom, he looked south, completing a raid on a city very close to Larsa itself in his first few years. In his seventh year, Hammurabi must have seen some kind of weakness in Larsa, or perhaps the omens told him to, because he concentrates his forces instead of spreading them out for raiding and defense along the entire southern border, and pushes south, first into Isin, and then continuing onward to Uruk, seizing in a single year the two jewels of Rimsin's career of conquest. Both cities likely welcomed Hammurabi as a liberator, but details are scarce for these early campaigns, and we are interpolating the details a bit from his later actions. Hammurabi's construction projects never stopped, but with Larsa on the defensive, Babylon was able to focus on expansion without worrying about being hit while their back was turned. There were very few targets available, nearly every civilized neighbor having been swallowed up in the past few decades. But tiny Malgium, which for nearly a hundred years has managed to remain a minor but independent power on the Tigris River, was all alone on the eastern edge of Sumer. If you've forgotten about Malgium, don't worry, most people do. No one really knows where the city was, and it only seems to show up in historical records when it's getting beaten by some other power. Larsa, Eshnuna, Isin, and maybe the Elamites have all had a good swing at the town, and now it's time for Hammurabi to have a go at it. 
He comes home with slaves, wealth, and land over the burnt and plundered ruins of Malgium, though the tiny kingdom still retains its independence and will build itself back up again at least a little bit. The year after, he's approached by Shamsi Dad. This is the first that we really have enough detail to see the complex political situation, since with Babylon's campaign into Malgium the previous year, Eshnuna, Malgium's northern neighbor, took the opportunity to take the city of Arapicum, which had set between Babylon and Shamsi Adad's empire and had been taken by Hammurabi's father. Shamsi Adad proposes an alliance whereby Babylon would use this as a pretext for war against Eshnuna, and Shamsi Adad would join in, attacking the eastern power from both north and south. Meeting in the middle, at Rapicum itself, the two kings agreed to a power sharing agreement, in which troops of each kingdom would sit on opposite sides of the river, each king ruling half the city. This arrangement was apparently peculiar enough that Hammurabi would comment on it to other rulers in later diplomatic correspondence as an example of wary friendship. It isn't clear exactly how long this tenuous situation lasted, but while the campaign against Eshnuna may have brought land and plunder, it failed to weaken them as much as both powers might have liked, and soon enough Eshnuna had retaken Rapicum again, perhaps in the same year or perhaps a year or two later, marching overland across the border of Hammurabi and Shamsi Adad to raid into Mari's land in the west. Hammurabi took control of a former Marriott town of Hit in the middle of this confusion, which was properly Shamsi Adad's town. And in diplomatic letters a decade later, we see that control over the city of Hit remained a sticking point between Mari and Babylon. The fact that Hammurabi was able to keep the city of Hit through all the confusion that would follow is of particular ritual significance, bringing us to our very first look at the law code of Hammurabi. The second law on the books states, If a man charges another man with practicing witchcraft, but cannot bring proof against him, he who is charged with witchcraft shall go to the divine river ordeal. He shall indeed submit to the divine river ordeal. If the divine river ordeal should overwhelm him, his accuser shall take full legal possession of his estate. If the divine river ordeal should clear that man and he should survive, he who made the charge of witchcraft against him shall be killed. He who submitted to the divine river ordeal shall take full legal possession of his accuser's estate. Now, there's quite a lot that we can unpack from this one little law. First of all, we see that in context, each law was made up of a hypothetical situation and what the correct response should be. These were meant almost like example cases, and it was the task of judges to reason from these existing examples to get a practical application for whatever specific case they were looking at. We also see, to a certain extent, the beauty of Hammurabi's law code, since we can extract a number of valuable legal principles just from this one short law. For example, it is an illustration of the general principle that if you accuse someone without anything to back up your accusation, then you should suffer the same punishment of what you're accusing the other person of. But it also indirectly lays out the legal penalty for practicing witchcraft. Since witchery was a subtle crime, it was often impossible for human judges to prove one way or the other. And as such, the case was referred to a trial by water, in which the gods would decide. The short version is that the person being tested would be thrown in the water, and if they drown, then that's the god's judgment, and the other party can take all his stuff. If he survives, then the other party is killed and loses all his stuff. A pretty serious test, but witchcraft was, and in many parts of the world still is, taken very seriously. We have a letter from Zimri Lim, a man who we will be hearing much more about in coming episodes, in which he describes a river ordeal. We don't know what the specifics were, only that it involved the people of Shubram and Hayasumu, two small tribes or villages that had come into some legal dispute before Zimri Lim. The letter reads, Concerning the people who had to submit to the river ordeal on account of Shubram and Hayasumu, whom my lord sent, I have sent comptrollers with this group. 
First, they made a woman jump in the water, and she came up immediately. Then they made an old man jump. After swimming a distance of eighty measures in the divine river, he saved himself and came up. After him, they made a second woman go down, and she came up immediately. After her, a third woman, and she drowned. Because the old man only swam eighty measures and the third woman drowned, the people of Hayasumu refused to let the last three women jump. They attested, the settlement in the fields do not belong to us. The old man threw himself before the feet of the people of Shubram and said, Do not make the remaining women jump, they may die. We will write a tablet that we don't claim the city and the fields. No one will ever in the future contest that the city and the fields belong to Shubram. They had such a tablet composed before the comptrollers, the Babylonian attendants, and the city elders. I will send the people who had to jump to my lord so he can question them. So the people of Hayasumu were thrown into the Euphrates River, possibly with some sort of heavy rock to carry as well, and the task was to swim underwater as far as possible before coming up for air and without drowning. Only one old man even managed to get past the starting point. Two came up immediately and one drowned. Such a poor showing that the people of Hayasumu realized that the gods had forsaken them and given up midway through the ordeal which I think is fascinating on its own. But to return to our point, the city of Hit, located on the Euphrates River, was seen as one of the most auspicious places to undertake these sorts of tests. Not only do we have this account of people from Mari, relatively nearby, settling a dispute in this manner, but we also know of people who came from as far away as Aleppo in modern Syria and Elam in modern Iran. For Hammurabi to take and retain control of this key religious site was incredibly prestigious. The expansionist king of Eshnunna died during this war against Hammurabi and Shamsi Adad, though probably of natural causes rather than battle wounds. And in the aftermath, Shamsi Adad and Hammurabi seems to have fallen into a disagreement, either created or exacerbated by the diplomats from Yamhad. This conflict was the war mentioned in Shamsi Adad's episode, in which Yamhad, to end the constant attacks from the kingdom of Upper Mesopotamia, got Babylon and Eshnunna, as well as some other tribes, to go to war with Shamsi Adad. While Shamsi Adad was put under a lot of pressure, he still managed to give as good as he got, and Babylon itself may have been saved only by a timely intervention back on the western front by the forces of Yamhad. Yamhad took a chunk of Mari, but seeing Shamsi Adad performing well for himself convinced Hammurabi to pull out of the fighting fairly quickly. The conclusion of the war appears to have brought the two monarchs even closer together, at least on paper, with a diplomatic document from Hammurabi describing his alliance with Shamsi Adad's family as being like a single house and a single finger. And Rapicum may have returned to its previous power sharing arrangement. Soon enough, they brought in Eshnunna under its new king to be a third partner in this little alliance, despite having spent the last few years fighting, and Eshnunna agrees. This is a time of pragmatism, not one for holding grudges, it would seem, and the next year the three of them prepared for a unified campaign against the region's weakest power, poor little Malgium. Again, the details are unclear in this episode particularly, but it appears that at the start of the campaign season, in the year 1777 BCE, the three powers gathered their forces in preparation for an attack, when they received an offer from the king of Malgium, promising them 15 kilograms of silver if they didn't attack. Now, 15 kilograms is a bit of an odd spot, about 2,000 shekels, which is quite a lot of money for a single person, but not very much for a kingdom, especially if it's split three ways. However, it seems to have been enough of an inducement to get all the troops to return home for the season, likely coupled with diplomatic and military events elsewhere in the world at the time. Hammurabi has been on his throne for about 15 years now, and if you can believe it, these are considered the quietest and most obscure years of his reign. We're going to be hanging out with the king of Babylon for a number of episodes to come, and with the people of his kingdom for many more besides. 
Next week, we move our story through the death of Shamsi Adad and the chaos following the collapse of the Upper Mesopotamian Empire. So join us next time as even more diplomatic wrangling collapses into open warfare and we look at the advanced techniques and horrifying realities of Middle Bronze Age sieges and assaults. Thank you for listening.